Okay, it looks like we have a good number and I know uh, the hour is late. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Care Stanford Cares Monthly Community Health Talk Series. My name is Robert Huang, and I'm a gastroenterologist and a cancer epidemiologist at Stanford University. I'm pleased to bring you this series of talks co-sponsored by Stanford Health Library and the Vincent V. C. Wu Memorial Foundation. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Howard Koh, who will speak on health equity and leadership for AANHPI populations, personal and professional perspectives. Achieving health equity is a compelling vision for our diverse nation but it requires a clear understanding of health outcomes for all major American populations and their subgroups. In the case of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, AANHPIs, the fastest growing racial ethnic group in the United States, fundamental data challenges have hindered progress. However, over the last decade, there have been some notable advancements. Dr. Ko, We'll delve into the complexities of AANHPI health disparities and explore the strides made in achieving health equity. <clears throat> AANHPI communities encompass more than 50 different ethnicities, 100 languages, and span from the US territories in the Pacific to New England. Understanding the heterogeneity within this population is crucial for documenting health outcomes, both overall and by subgroup and comparing them with those of non-Hispanic whites and other populations. Dr. Howard Coe is the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He previously served as the 14th Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services after being nom nominated by President Barack Obama and previously served as Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts after being appointed by Governor William Weld. A graduate of Yale College and the Yale University School of Medicine, he trained at Boston City Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital, earned board certifications in four medical fields, has been principal investigator of research grants totaling 27 million US dollars, has published more than 300 articles in the medical and public health literature has received over 70 awards, including and including six honorary doctoral degrees. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard Koh. Dr. Koh. Thank you so much, Dr. Huang, and welcome everybody. It's such a great honor to be before this distinguished audience. And I wanna thank Stanford Care and the Stanford Health Library and the Vincent Wu Foundation for sponsoring this presentation today. It's my great pleasure to talk about health equity and also offer some perspectives on leadership for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander populations, AA and HPI populations. This is an area that has been important to me my whole life, and it's very personal to me. So I'm going to make this a very personal perspective as well as a professional perspective. And it's going to be a broad overview on some of the health equity issues facing our community today. And then I look forward to your questions and thank you so much for your hospitality. Next slide. First, I wanna say that it was about four or five years ago that I got to see the vibrant nature of Stanford care when Dr. Rob Huang and Dr. Juha Huang and other colleagues invited me out to speak. And I got to see your vital community in action. So. I feel like an honorary member of your community, and I followed very closely what Stanford is doing with respect to AA and HPI health. So thank you for having me here today. Next slide. So if you ask, what's the status of the AA and HPI population in the United States right now? I would say we're still in a very uncertain time. On one hand, we get celebrated in the news for contributing to the social fabric of our society. So here's one major example through um, the Olympics and other athletic contests. You often see headlines celebrating American excellence in terms of skating and snowboarding and figure skating. Uh, and we are held up as leaders for American society. 
Uh, it is also even notable in a humorous example of advancement that Ji Young, the first Asian and Korean American Muppet, was introduced on Sesame Street a couple of years ago. So we could say, well, in general, our community is making progress in terms of being recognized as being a very important part of the social fabric. Next slide. But as you know, uh, we are still in a very difficult time with respect to the aftermath of COVID and the associated uh, hate incidents that have been well documented over the last number of years. The shootings, the number of hate incidents being tracked by our colleagues at UC San Francisco, Stop AAPI Hate. Uh, we know those incidents uh, have reached high numbers and we know, unfortunately, they're driven by hate directed against the uh, ethnicities represent, represented by our group because violence is accompanied by cries of you brought the virus here or go back to where you came from. Uh, I know all of us in the NHPI community are familiar with hearing that. Uh, I know whenever I heard that when I was a kid, especially, I would think, what does that really mean? What if you came from the United States of America? So that's the quandary we're in. And despite the fact that our community contributes so much to the social fabric of our country, we're often viewed as foreigners in our own society. And then when you look at polls and surveys taken through COVID of all Asian Americans, whether they were directly subjected to violence and racism through COVID-19 or not, more than half feel that their mental health was affected by reports of discrimination and violence. Over half reported feeling unsafe in public because of their race and ethnicity. Uh, I got to contribute to an analysis of about 12 nationally representative polls. Over on the right, you see the reference from Health Affairs Forefront last year with my colleague Mary Findling as the first author. And so I, I have written about this in journals like JAMA, and here is a reference on the bottom about healing and health equity for our population, where I write this viewpoint along with my dear colleagues, Julia Choi and Jeff Caballero. Next slide. So this is all very personal for us. And let me just start and share some of my personal story. Uh, I am here because of the sacrifice of my parents, Dr. Kwang Lim Ko and Dr. Haesung Chun Ko over on the left is a picture of them as a young couple who uh, met in this country and married and stayed here searching for the American dream. Uh, I lost my dad over 35 years ago, still miss him every day. But on um, the bottom left is a picture of my mom, who's 94 years young. And I'm very happy and proud of her, first of all, because she's been such a pioneer for US-Korea relations. But she has also been here long enough and lived long enough to see the results of her sacrifice. And I'll, I'll be saying more about some other members of my family in just a second. But over on the right is my family, and I'm so, so proud of them. My wife, Dr. Claudia Arig, who's an ophthalmologist. My son, Steve, who's to my immediate left, who's an associate law professor at Boston University. My son, Dan, on the right, who's the deputy cabinet secretary in the White House for President Biden. And over on the extreme left, my daughter, Katie, Dr. Katie Ko, who's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist and a street psychiatrist for Boston Healthcare for the homeless. I tell audiences that when you grow up in an immigrant family, you don't take this country for granted. You don't take rights and freedom for granted. And I know I learned from my parents from the time I was a very young child, there was meaning and purpose to our journey in this country. And we were supposed to get the best education possible and then grow up and do something to help serve society. And we've tried to pass that on to our own kids, my wife and I, and we're very proud of them. And I know if I got to talk to each and every one of you, you would have this story about your family and your goals and hopes for being in this country and making a contribution to your community as well. Next slide. And my dad uh, had this wonderful saying, which I repeat often in talks like this, to be broad like the sky. He, he would often point out that oftentimes in society and in education and academia, there's a push for you to get more and more narrow in your focus in life. 
but he encouraged uh, us kids and in fact everyone to keep our vision broad for the future. So I think about this saying a lot as I go about my uh, daily life. It, it has inspired me and made me think about the big picture and actually was a factor in me going into public health after starting my career in clinical medicine. Next slide. So I just wanna review, this may sound very basic, but when we talk about health, I think about two major statements from the World Health Organization 70 years ago. Next slide. First, the state is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So this is a very broad definition, and it's really critical to think of health this broadly, not just physical well-being, not just mental well-being, but also social, and if I can say spiritual well-being as well. And then uh, the WHO Constitution in the 1940s wrote, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. If you come to visit us at our school at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health in Boston, this saying is engraved in concrete in seven languages uh, on the front of our so-called FXB human rights building. So helping all people reach the highest attainable standard of health is a public health goal that we all share and a, a goal for sessions like tonight. Next slide. So again, to make this very personal, when I started my career as a physician and particularly an oncologist and a cancer specialist, I started looking at graphs like this, asking what are the leading causes of death in men and women in our society? And you see these trends over the last century or so that describe trends in prostate cancer, colorectal, stomach, other important cancers. Uh, but there's one important cancer that stands out, of course. You hit the next button. And that's lung cancer, of course, driven to, to such a large degree by tobacco addiction. Next slide. So as a young physician, I got drawn into public health because I saw that if I was gonna make a difference in the, in the area I trained in, in cancer, that I had to make some contribution in tobacco control. And at that time, now this is several decades ago, our state was involved in raising the tobacco tax through a ballot initiative. And people of Massachusetts were asked to come to the polls and vote yes or no for an added 25 cent tax increase per pack of cigarettes. And the agreement was that if it passed, the millions of dollars generated would go into state coffers for public health and tobacco control in particular. So it passed in 1992 and made history. Actually, it's appropriate that I'm talking to the California audience because California was the first state ever to do this in 1988. So we were the second state. And so public health history and tobacco control history was made then. Over on the right, I'll never forget the leadership of Dr. Blake Cady and Candace Pierce of the American Cancer Society. I got involved in all of this as a young volunteer. And this also changed my life because it made me see the power of public health and politics, in this case, in beating back the tobacco industry in Massachusetts. It was that visibility actually that led then Governor William Weld to appoint me as Commissioner of Public Health in 1997. Next slide. And so I went from being a young physician trained uh, in the clinical setting only to becoming a public health professional first at the state level, and then later from 2009 to 2014 at the federal level. Next slide. And I joined the Obama administration, was sworn in as Assistant Secretary for Health, got to uh, support the president and then Vice President, now President Biden, of course. I uh, worked with my colleague, Dr. Fauci, back then on H1N1, the last pandemic. And of course, we have admired his leadership through COVID. And then on the bottom left is a picture that's very important for my family because in the fall of 2009, then President Obama asked his top NHPI appointees to stand behind him as he signed this executive order reinvigorating the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So standing behind the president uh, wearing a blue tie is me, as you can see. 
And standing to my immediate left in this picture is my brother, Harold Coe. He's in the pink tie. Uh, Harold at the time was the top lawyer in the State Department under Secretary Clinton. So uh, needless to say, my mother loves this picture. Next slide. So through this whole run, as a young kid growing up, as a medical student, as a physician, and then as a public official, I've thought a lot about what it is to be part of the AA and HPI community, what it is to be a son of an immigrant family, and look for data and understanding about our population. But as you know, we're often invisible or misunderstood. Uh, we are certainly profoundly heterogeneous. Uh, too often we're still treated as outsiders, as them rather than us and as foreigners in our own country. And we are so heterogeneous, I often point out that the term Asian American is as useful as the term European American. And we have many ethnicities, many languages spoken, as Dr. Huang mentioned as he introduced me, uh, about close to 60% are foreign born. Uh, we have some subpopulations of our community less than proficient in English. And a major challenge for all of us has been the data, good data for AA and HPI populations has long been incomplete, misclassified, aggregated, or just simply absent. And when you can't find data, you just assume that there's no problem and no disparity when, of course, the exact opposite is true. So over the years, many of us in the academic community, particularly at Stanford and elsewhere, have just kept sounding the urgency for more accurate, disaggregated data for our populations. And I'm going to be saying more about that through this, this presentation. It is a theme that was evident to me when I was a young medical student looking for information on the AA and HPI health. It was important to me as the first Asian American Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts. And I thought a lot about this and worked on this as the Assistant Secretary with some outcomes that I'm very proud to report uh, in, in some slides coming up. Next slide. So you all know that we are the fastest growing minority group in the country, some 23 million of us right now. We are projected to surpass some 46 million by 2060. We have the six groups that have population over a million in our country, Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese American. Next slide. And I like this graphic that shows how heterogeneous we are by uh, educational attainment on the X axis and on median household income on the Y, on the y axis. So you see, for example, on the top right, Indian American subpopulations uh, generally rank high according to those two criteria. We're over on the bottom left, uh, we have subgroups like uh, the Samoan or Laotian or Native Hawaiian groups uh, that uh, rank low according to these two criteria. So the heterogeneity of our group is something that we have to be very aware of. I'm sure you think a lot about this at Stanford. Next slide. And the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations deserve a lot of attention as well. Uh, I know I was sensitized to this because when I was assistant secretary, on my way back from an international conference in Singapore, I visited Micronesia and stopped in Chuk, Micronesia. On, on the right, you see pictures of me touring the island uh, with the then US ambassador to Micronesia. And on the very bottom, the ambassador and I are standing for what looks like a bookcase, but it's actually a walk-in clinic. And we were standing in front of the pharmacy there. And the whole facility had a couple cots there. And I'm posing there with the healthcare professionals who were staffing that clinic. So I'll, I'll never forget how brave those health professionals were, uh, how isolated this island was how much need there was, but it was all part of the AA and HPI experience. And of course, with the fire in Maui, 
that just recently occurred, uh, this has gotten so much attention to the suffering of the people of Hawaii th th through that tragedy. Next slide. So uh, one major achievement in terms of data collection came through the Affordable Care Act, which of course was started in 2010, a major achievement of, of the Obama administration. In section 4302, updated data collection standards for all HHS sponsored health surveys involving self-reported information to include additional detail for race, ethnicity, and also sex, primary language, and disability status. And I, I was ecstatic to see this and uh, helped coordinate HHS-wide efforts to update the data standards. We also published on this, as you saw, see in this publication on the bottom left, uh, which was led by my colleague, uh, Dr. Rashida Dorsey. But over on the right, you can see that uh, before this passed, you would answer surveys and it would ask, what is your race? Usually the options were white, black, American Indian or Asian, or rather Alaska Native or other. You know, many of us have spent our lives in the other category, but here, because of section 4302 of the ACA, there were multiple options for the Asian American population, Asian Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and also for the Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander population, Native Hawaiian, Chamo uh, Guamanian or Chamoran, Samoan or other Pacific Islander. So this was an opportunity to gather accurate disaggregated data. And I think over time, we are seeing more and more publications showing the result of the precision of getting information when it, it's disaggregated uh, because of methods like this. Next slide. And so here in 2023, we see current status of Medicaid expansion as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And you know that uh, over 30 million Americans have now uh, gained access to care be be because of the Affordable Care Act. So that was, it's a great honor to be part of that. As the Assistant Secretary for Health, I helped implement the ACA along with so many in my department and then thousands across the country. And with respect to AA and HPI populations, the advocates did heroic work trying to sign up people into health plans and into um, Medicaid. Oftentimes we heard the criticism, oh, this is too hard. And you know this population is too heterogeneous and you have to employ people who are comfortable with outreach in, in so many different languages. Are we really gonna make an impact? So we try to track not only health insurance coverage uptake, but also whether we're reducing disparities in, in health insurance coverage. Next slide. And so getting that data was, was and remains very, very important. Also, uh, in terms of getting dedicated data for our population, you may probably know the researchers in the, in the audience, but there's something called the N. Haynes study, which is a time-honored way of getting data about the American people through these trailers, and I'm posing here before a team uh, involved in the N. Hayden survey, and this, this involves personal interviews, standardized physical examinations, even laboratory measurements. And in 2011, N. Haynes became began oversampling Asian Americans for the first time ever. On the bottom right, you see me posing with a commission core officer, where if you go into this trailer, they'll ask about dietary intake and put you through some simulation models. And this led to, to articles like you see in the bottom left, overview of Asian American data collection release and analysis from N. Haynes 2011 to 2018. So these are articles for the first time that start showing dedicated health information related to the AA and HPI population. So if I can say, as the assistant secretary during that time, and now as a professor, it's been very gratifying to see this improvement over the years. Next slide. So back to the ACA, I'll never forget, after I left government, I came back to Harvard and I was looking at disparities of health insurance coverage 
pre and post ACA. And you would see data like this. In gray is the pre-ACA rates for whites, blacks, and Hispanic Americans. The good news is that the uninsured numbers dropped for all three categories. But the research assistant I had, who was at the time a public health student at, at Harvard, uh, a, a physician of Asian heritage, came to me and said, Dr. Ko, there's been no analysis of the impact of the ACA on a a NHPI populations. I said, what, are you sure? Can that be right? I mean, this has been now a number of years since the ACA had passed. And so uh, his assessment was accurate. We, we looked closely. So we decided to do something about this. And this student of mine, uh, Dr. John Park, led a couple analyses. Uh, I served as senior author, and I was able to bring in some wonderful colleagues who are so well known in this area. Doctors Ben Summers, Arnie Epstein, Graham Kolditz, Sarah Humble. And what we did was to fill in information about how these rates were changed for the AA and HPI population for the first time. So there it is. And there you see that to our delight, that there, there was substantial improvement for lowering the rates of uninsured for AA and HPI population. And next slide. And we, if you look closely, as of 2016, the uninsured rates for whites and the AA and HPI population were essentially the same. But before the ACA, the AA and HPI population had higher numbers of uninsured, but now that disparity had, had closed. So that was pretty big news. And we published this in both Health Affairs and, and JAMA Internal Medicine. Now, the major caveat was that was seven years ago. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen peer-reviewed data to update these trends. Uh, we hope it has continued on, but this is one example how, of how disparities can be closed. And I think the credit goes to the tremendous advocates across the country who, who did outreach in multiple languages and with navigators and uh, assisters and just did not give up. And I just want to credit them as I show these results. Next slide. And then because we wanted to demonstrate that this affected every major subgroup, uh, we looked into those trends. And sure enough, here you see how the rates of insured increased for Japanese Americans, Asian, Indian, Filipino, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and other Asian. And so it was, it's been very, very gratifying to see results like this. We, we published this in the Academy Health blog in 2018. And uh, again, we hope these trends have continued. We, we need more current data now that it's 2023, but we are very proud of the impact of the ACA for many reasons, but one is to decrease disparities and actually eliminate this disparity as of 2016 between whites and the AA and HPI population. Next slide. And then I've had the honor of being involved in a number of other national efforts for AA and HPI health. When I came to Washington and became the assistant secretary, I was very aware that I was the first Asian American assistant secretary for health ever. So I wanted to do whatever I could to help my community. And it was brought to my attention that chronic hepatitis, especially hep B, obviously is disproportionately higher for the AA and HPI population than for non-Hispanic whites. Uh, there wasn't a national strategy really for either hep B or hep C at the time. And you see here some basic facts that uh, half of the US hep B burden occurs among AAPIs. One in 12 are infected and far less than 50% of those chronically infected with hep B are even aware of their zero status. A lot of this work, pioneering work, was done by my colleague, Dr. Sam So of Stanford. So he chaired a National Academy of Medicine committee on addressing chronic hepatitis as a major public health challenge. And then he came to us at HHS and said, can we work together so that your department puts this into action. And I want to thank my dear colleagues, Drs. Ron Valdeseri and John Ward, who were then at HHS and CDC at the time, my senior advisor at the time, Rosie Henson, 
And we started this National Viral Hepatitis Action Plan, established a special unit at HHS, and that's ongoing up through the current time and going forward. And just this past summer in JAMA, Dr. Zvaldasari Ward and I wrote an update to progress on the plan, talking about the need to continue to overcome health inequities, even though tremendous progress has been made in terms of screening recommendations and especially treatment for hep C too. Next slide. Now I have many memories of special outreach for the AA and HPI populations for hep B posters in multiple languages. So here, here's one example of me doing outreach in both English and multiple Asian languages. I, I always chuckle when I see this because, you know, when you do public health, you use every part of who you are to send a message of public health and health promotion. And as I, you see below, the ACIP now recommends that all adults ages 19 to 59 should receive hepatitis B vaccines. So this is real advancement for hepatitis B nationwide. So many advocates have been involved in this, so many from the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community. Special thanks again to Dr. So, who taught me a lot and has served as a role model for all of us at Stanford and beyond. Next slide. And then uh, at Stanford, I got to first meet Dr. Juha Huang and Dr. Rob Huang, and they educated me about the public health challenges for gastric cancer for the AA and HBI population. As you can see, the crude incidents for various age groups by Korean Americans, Japanese Americans, and other groups. Juha and Rob made me aware that screening efforts have been pretty active in Korea and Japan and elsewhere for quite a while. And don't we need similar type of attention for these subpopulations in the US? And so there have been really heroic efforts by the GI leaders at Stanford and beyond some, some wonderful, fascinating conferences that I've been very honored to attend and uh, try to add some policy perspectives here attempts to put this before the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force to see if they would weigh in on the advisability of screening and prevention for gastric cancer. So that work is ongoing, and I just want to, again, thank the Stanford community for their leadership in this. It's very exciting to see attention paid. Now, progress in public health policy is very, very slow, so um, this is going to continue to require a lot of patience. But when you see crude incidence trends like this, you can see why leaders like Juha and Rob and others have decided that this is worth tackling on behalf of public health. Next slide. This is a, the COVID era, and here we are as 2023 is ending with 1.1 million Americans who have, who have died from COVID-19. So again, as this pandemic started, I looked for data for AA and HBI, and particularly disaggregated data, still hard to find. Very frustrating. And not that many publications, at least initially, uh, hard to get a definitive idea of how this is affecting our community right now. Over on the right, here's some updated data. I think this is from Kaiser, suggesting that the AA and HBI population has not suffered as high rates of infection, hospitalization, or deaths compared to uh, other major ethnic groups in the US. But we always have to check and see how good the data is supporting this. Uh, on, on the bottom, it looks like from the data I've seen that the vaccination rates among the NHPI population have been generally pretty good. So let, let's see if that holds up over time. Uh, I know initially there's a lot of concern about uh, challenges with vaccine hesitancy and uh, trust in the system. Uh, it, it could be that over time, you know, we have seen this play out so that vaccination rates have, are doing very, very well. But let's see if we can see more publications on this coming forward and have more definitive answers about how our community is doing through COVID. Next slide. And then of course, it's worth pointing to other major health disparities, mental health for youth, and adults, all the Asian hate issues have exacerbated, exacerbated these 
crisis, and, and I've already pointed out to that uh, in my opening comments. Uh, diabetes is another one. And um, it's been documented that Asian Americans have higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes at relatively low BMI cut points. So there have been efforts to screen at 23. It's a logo from the American Diabetes Association. And then I've already mentioned my personal and professional commitment to tobacco control. Uh, th this is uh, an issue, of course, that is very challenging in Asia, particularly among men. And so I, I have witnessed how this has affected members of my own family. And, and, and it's just terrible to see the uptake of tobacco dependence uh, for certain po populations. Uh, Asian American immigrant men uh, without a college degree who have resided in the US for at least 10 years, uh, some data show that the, the prevalence of tobacco use could be as high as 23%. Yeah, even though the overall rate in the United States is about 11, 11% or so. Next slide. So again, th this is an area that I, I've been doing outreach on ever since I was a state health commissioner. Uh, <laughs> here they pictured me uh, back then saying in my best Korean, Tom Shida, let's quit tobacco. But they would put me out on other posters. Next slide in multiple other languages that I can't speak <laughs> on top of a temple here over on the right. So uh, you can look at this. And again, you know, the message is that when you do public health, you try to use every part of who you are to send a message of health promotion and disease prevention. Next slide. So what are the challenges for our community in terms of uh, leadership now? Because you know, our population is growing in the in the country. I'll show you some slides. Uh, actually, here here they are. Right now, the AANPI comprised about 20% of physicians in the US, uh, almost a quarter of medical school enrollees. So that's that's astonishing. Um, uh, but the NIH, NIH research budget dedicated to AANHPI health needs has barely increased over the last 20 years. And when you look at Medical research studies in 2021, 2022, 23. Uh, at this point, we should always see data relevant to the AA and HPI population and not always have us in the other category. But that's still not the case. And this one meta analysis in 2021 showed that only about a quarter of studies had data for the AA and HPI population, and uh, very few broke those down into subgroups. So we need to have progress. We need to have more leaders in our community. Overall, on the right, I point to some colleagues of mine who have reached leadership positions. I'm very proud to mention them. Dr. Karen Kim is a physician who was named as the new dean of Penn State College of Medicine, I believe the first Asian American uh, woman dean of a US medical school. So we're very proud of Karen. At, at my school, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, uh, we have an interim dean, Jane Kim, who's a fellow Korean American. So we're very proud of her. Uh, you know, we want to send the message that members of our community can be healthcare professionals, can be physicians, can be nurses, can be leaders in all those fields, uh, but but also serve at the highest level in terms of hospital leadership, medical school leadership. Uh, but we're not seeing the numbers yet. So we got to keep encouraging one, one another. And the NHPI medical students are the least represented of all. So we, we got to track these trends going forward. Next slide. So how do we improve equity and inclusion for AA and NHPI patients and practitioners in academic medicine? Lots of discussion these days about having more diverse and inclusive health organizations. Everybody is a person who has blind spots, and we all have to be a, humble about that and be aware of our own blind spots as we try to be the best leaders we can. Uh, we have to be very sensitive to the AA and HPI hate issues, which are still out there. Um, and then also push for more research studies that report outcomes relevant to our community, particularly with the best disaggregated data possible. Next slide. If I had to summarize 
the, the simple message uh, for this audience and for every audience when we talk about AA and HPI health is avoid assumptions. Uh, I don't know about you, but as an Asian American, I've had so many examples of people assuming certain things about who I am. Um, and people will make assumptions about your race and ethnicity, your birthplace, your first language, your socioeconomic status, your spouse or partner, your sexual orientation, your worldview. And, uh, you know, when this spills over, especially into patient care, it, it can be quite harmful. And so one basic message I often send in talks like this is when, when you have an a, a, a HPI patient, don't assume, don't assume, ask, and then listen respectfully. And if we do that, we, we can improve patient care, offer better person-centered care, uh, try, to, try to move more and more people toward the highest attainable standard of health. Uh, these are issues that I often join with colleagues like Karen Kim, who I've already mentioned, Dr. Holly Humphrey from the Macy Foundation. I also, this is a picture of Dr. Winston Wong, who, who is a, a big champion for AA and HPI physicians. So these are themes that we, we talk about a lot. Next slide. And then uh, there remains national coordination of these efforts. People may not know that in 1999, President Clinton established the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and the Pacific Islanders. And that initiative has carried through successive presidential administrations. On the bottom left is, is a picture of when President Obama visited a meeting of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And I, I happen to be sitting uh, in that meeting, you might be able to see me there in the in the background. So that, that was quite an amazing uh, moment. But on the bottom right, you see where President Biden has re-energized this initiative by signing the COVID Hate Crimes Act, re reauthorizing the initiative, and pushing for goals for the White House initiative to re respond to anti-Asian bias and violence, to really push for more disaggregated data and to expand uh, la language access programs across all federal government, particularly since uh, you know our population is so heterogeneous. Behind the president here in this picture are leaders that hopefully we all recognize and support uh, the vice president, of course, uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu from California. I I've known Judy for a long time, a tremendous leader for our community. Congresswoman Grace Meng from New York, Senator Hirano from Hawaii, seated is uh, Senator Duckworth from, from Illinois, of course. So we're very lucky to have these leaders in Congress pushing for our community, and hopefully we can, we can support them as we try to make progress for public health. Next slide. And then uh, I really want to single out these national groups, the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, led by my dear colleague, Julia Choi. She's the president and CEO. The Asi Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, APCHO, Jeff Caballero, who's been service in service in that capacity for a long time. Je Jeff is so, so dedicated to the community. The National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians, Winston Wong, I already mentioned him. Dr. Humphrey of uh, the Josiah Macy Foundation. I happen to serve on her board. Next slide. And, and as I end, I just want to comment briefly on leadership because many of us think, oh, well, we don't see many people in leadership who are of an Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander background. But uh, when you've had life experiences like I have, you, you say to yourself, okay, here's my opportunity to make a contribution uh, even though there are no obvious role models to follow. And, you know, we, we have to learn from leaders around us that this is leadership as a choice, not a position. We have to help influence others by unleashing their power and potential to impact the greater good. Leadership is the art of mobilizing others to want to struggle for shared aspirations. That's classic definitions from Kuznets and Posner. And if you want to do leadership work, this is tough work. It's very lonely. Uh, this 
fascinating quote from Mary Lou Anderson. Leaders are called to stand in that lonely place between the long, no longer and the not yet. They're called to stand in that lonely place between the no longer and the not yet. Uh, I think of that often, especially as I teach my students, that if you're a leader that's going to be re remembered, you have to take a risk and stand in that lonely place. Hopefully, we can do this on behalf of our community uh, more and more uh, going forward. Next slide. And how do you best do this? You understand why you started on this journey that has to do with one's meaning and purpose. I think it's a very spiritual theme. As you introduce yourself to one another, can you talk about why you're committed to addressing health disparities or promoting health equity or serving the AA and HPI community, making it very personal so you can connect with others and then making it unique so that people will remember you. Uh, I learned a lot about this through trial and error through my own journey, if I can say, but I'm trying to teach this to others now that I'm a senior professor at the Harvard School of Public Health. Next slide. Uh, we need to emphasize that this is not just about strategy and head and action and hands, but just as importantly, narrative and heart, addressing the why and the motivation in a very personal and profound way. Next slide. And when I give this talk, especially the students, oftentimes I'll hear, oh, well, this sounds interesting. You know, I have a lot of concerns, but I don't really have much influence. My circle of influence is very small. You know, I don't have any power. I don't have a fancy position. I don't have any money. Uh, what should I do? And if you read the famous book by Steve Covey, a leadership guru who published this nationally best-selling book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he would write that you should focus on your circle of influence. And when you do, it'll grow. And people will notice and they'll give you more responsibilities and your circle influ influence will grow again. And that's how leaders get fostered and supported. So I've always been fascinated by that graphic. And I show that to, to you here. Next slide. And then as I end, uh, I think the um, one of the best quotes I've ever heard for interacting with people with building partnerships is from Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. To be an effective leader, you have to be so aware of this literally in every action, interaction you have with people day in and day out. If you can do this well and make people feel respected and supported, that's your way of building your community, building your networks, and helping you reach your highest potential as, as a leader, particularly in the field of public health. Next slide. So I'm hoping that with all these examples from the world of health disparities and health equity, uh, you can take some lessons away for yourself to help all people in the AA NHPI community and well beyond to enjoy the highest attainable standard of health. And if you do, you're making a contribution to public health that we all respect and admire so much. So thank you again for having me here at Stanford and I appreciate your time and attention. So thank you for an insightful and informative and an inspiring talk. <clears throat> and also thank you for all the work that you've done for the ANHPI community, including your work on hepatitis B, your work on data disaggregation, and your work in promoting Asians and leadership. I'd like to let the audience know that we are open for questions. So if you would please uh, type in your questions in the chat. I know that we've gotten numerous questions already. And Howard, I could just, I could ask questions for the next hour, but <laughs> um, I wanna be respectful to our audience and uh, uh, let uh, let our audience members ask a couple of questions. So we already have a docket here of four or five questions. So I'm just gonna start, um, start picking from the top here. Okay, so what are the most significant social determinants of health for AANHPI populations? And what social determinants of health are important but often neglected? Okay, that's a huge question. And, you know, I think everybody is thinking about social determinants right now because we understand that it's much more than simple biology that affects 
whether you have any chance of reaching your highest attainable standard of health or not. Some of the basic ones that apply to all people have to do with uh, housing security and, and food security. I think I mentioned at the beginning, uh, or maybe I didn't, uh, that uh, health and homelessness is now a major priority that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. All that work is inspired by my daughter, Dr. Katie Coe, who, as I mentioned, is a street psychiatrist for the homeless. And when, when you think about the affordable housing crisis in our country and the very visible homelessness crisis in our country, and that affects people of color disproportionately, that, that's something we should pay attention to. On the flip side, uh, one very powerful social group uh, are people who are faith leaders. I think not enough attention has been paid to that. And that, that theme might apply very well for the AA and HBI community. O oftentimes, members of our community are, are strong people of faith, and it gets through 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 hardships and it supports them in in uh, their ups and downs of life. So when I hear a question like that, those are some of the social determinants I, I think of. Another question we have <coughs> is concerning innovations in digital health. Um, so what are some innovations in digital health that you've seen that are advancing health outcomes positively for AANHPI populations? Uh, this is a time where so much attention to digital health and social media through, through COVID. And I, I would like I would like to think that if we do this well through digital health and other innovations, that, that we can try to improve trust and preventive measures like vaccine, e even though we're all facing challenges with misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. Actually, Bob, I, I chaired a National Academy of Medicine committee on rebuilding trust and tackling the infodemic through the pandemic era. And so this is a challenge for all of us. And I think social media and digital health can be a double-edged sword here. We often talk about the negatives, but I also think it can be used for good. So I would love to see more attention to, to that because the, the misinformation, disinformation challenges out there, and we, we all have to be all involved in that for all communities. We have a question about stigmas. Uh, so the question reads, do stigmas within AANHPI culture influence health disparities? And I would like to add on to this question. You know, I've um, participated in many of uh, these Asian uh, health panels uh, over the last year or two. And it seems that this uh, a question that, that I get asked a lot, which I, I can't really answer, is uh, specifically regarding mental health, stigmas around mental health uh, and being uh, Asian. I'm wondering if you have any insight uh, into that question. Yeah, so lots of ways to answer that. <clears throat> First, it's been well documented that of all groups who uh, should be seeking treatment and care for mental health challenges, for whatever reason, the AA and HPI community ranks near the bottom at, at seeking treatment and help. And I think that's a uh, result of stigma in our community, uh, oftentimes from the immigrant community, where you're not supposed to talk about these issues and uh, you know, pe people aren't forward and open about needing care and needing help in the in the way they could and should. I, I think we are seeing progress here, but but not enough. So hopefully we have more and more professionals who are sensitive to these issues. Um, we can encourage our colleagues in the community to, to seek care and help if, if they have mental health challenges. Uh, and then I think overall that with the stigma themes, again, I think come up because uh, this is the fundamental point I made uh, in my talk is that too often you see a person of AA and HPI background, and you make all kinds of assumptions about who they are and um, what their worldview is and what their cultural views are and whether they can speak certain languages or not. And, you know, we have to, we have to just treat each other as human beings and as fellow members of the AA and HPI community. And if you don't know, ask, but withhold judgment and don't make any assumptions. We, we also need to make sure that those assumptions don't spill over into healthcare if you're a physician or health professional taking care of somebody. 
uh, because that's that's not what person-centered care is all about. So I, I think uh, those are some ways for me to answer that question, Rob. Right. Thank you. Okay. Now looking through here. So, um, so I have a question then uh, for you, Howard, and this is about kind of the definition of of being Asian. So, you know, before before you started talking, we we had a chance to talk about about your children and uh, your your three uh, children and your five uh, grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you see as uh, you know as Asians as as we have kids and they have kids, you know, the they're going to be exposed to different lifestyles, different dietary influences from a young age. Uh, genetically, they may even be different as uh, you know, Asians uh, 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 intermarry. So what is, how do you, how do you see the needs of Asian health uh, evolving with generations uh, 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 in, in the United States? Great question. So I, I tend to be very inclusive there. You know, my kids, for example, are so, so proud of their Korean American heritage. You, you just can't meet anybody more proud of being part of the AA and HPI community than they are. So, um, you know, some surveys count inclusively people like my own kids. Others don't. I don't understand why it has to be so restrictive. And then if you go through the history of how ethnicities are defined and tracked by the Census Bureau year, uh, decade in and decade out and go back into, I think it was late 1700s when the census started. I, I did this once and then had made some slides for various talks. Every decade since the census started, the way ethnic minorities were defined changed. You never had two decades in a row <laughs> where the definitions were, were the same. Uh, so it just shows how subjective it can be fundamentally. And so if you want a society that celebrates diversity and is inclusive, you know, I, I would push for having uh, categories where people can self-identify as, as as, as being part of a, a, a an HBI background, and, and and having them part of that community, I think it, it just sends a message of inclusion and and welcoming that we all need much more of in our society. Well, Howard, thank you for your time again tonight. We're running on the uh, the end of our time here. Uh, it's uh, about seven thirty p.m. here on the West Coast, ten thirty p.m. Uh, and so, <laughs> thank you again for. Uh, spending uh, your evening uh, with us here at Stanford Care. Uh, and on behalf of our organization, we wanted to express our sincere gratitude uh, for your talk tonight and your continuing involvement in all of our efforts uh, here at Stanford. As a brief shout out, I wanted to mention that the Stanford Care, the inaugural Japanese health webinar is scheduled to be held on October 25th at 7 p.m. It will feature Dr. Fumiaki Ikeno, who will present on healthcare innovation in Japan. So we encourage all of you to attend uh, that talk as well. Uh, and so without uh, anything further to keep us, I think we're going to adjourn uh, tonight's talk. Thank you again, Howard. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>